thank you rajni uh, so good afternoon good evening everyone and welcome to this session on the national policy impetus for sustainable growth in agribusiness now i have already spoken on sustainability in several of my previous sessions sustainability is about continuity in business it is about meeting the demands of the present as well as of the future so obviously sustainability in agriculture and agri business is about continuity in agri business meeting the agricultural commodity and production demands of the consumers in the present as well as future securing resources and food systems for the future generations and if you remember the triple bottom approach that i had talked about it is about people and planet in addition to profits now before we begin speaking on the policy impetus let us have a quick review of where agricultural sector in india stands today so this is directly taken from the press information bureau uh, new delhi government of india and this has been actually declared officially in a written note by the agriculture minister himself sri narendra singh tomar that the contribution to of agriculture sector to gdp of our country has been declining in the past 3 days although marginally but from 20.3 in 2021 it has come down to 18.3 in 22 23 the current fiscal however despite the decline and a lot of it is thanks to uh, the pandemic which is like once in a millennium time of a global calamity despite this decline we are seeing that agricultural income of farmers is constantly increasing today it is steady but it is all poised for rapid growth and this is all thanks to a robust policy or in fact robustness in a set of policies a coordinated execution plan and actual execution on ground so it's a big kudos to the government and all related agencies and institutions which has which have played a pivotal role in this growth story and we'll look at what is that growth story in a bit so agriculture which is a primary sector employs about 49% of the working population of india that is the significance of agriculture and for obvious reason that is why it is called a primary sector manufacturing or production is a secondary sector and services is largely the tertiary sector now the sector is pred predicted to increase to us 24 billion dollars in just about couple of years less than a couple of years now at the current exchange rate this is a whopping almost 2 lakh crore indian rupees that's the size of the agriculture market which it is set to capture in just a little over uh, a little less than 2 years accordingly the cumulative fdi inflow is more than 10% of this growth size just between year 2000 and 2022 a little over 3 years a cumulative fdi inflow of more than 10% the size of the market has already been received entered into india indian agriculture has the wor world's largest cattle herd buffaloes so foregone conclusion that we are the world's largest producer of milk we are also the largest producer of pulses and spices particularly particularly within pulses the millets are a crop of emphasis it has also found a significant provision in the union budget this year we are the world's largest area planted to wheat rice and cotton we are the second largest producer of fruits and vegetables along with cotton tea farmed fish sugarcane wheat rice and sugar all basic important most important agricultural commodities consumed the world over regardless of ethnicity ethnicities and cultural diversities we are the second largest agricultural land despite not being one of the largest countries in the world and we are the sixth largest food and grocery market now again despite all these firsts to our credit there are a plethora of problems nagging and glaring us in the face particularly in agriculture the first and foremost now now here one thing to note here is although i have largely categorized these problems into uh, the farmers the consumers and the government brackets a lot of them are overlapping and common 
across all the three categories. They cut across all three uh, groups. And also, this is not an exhaustive list. The problems run into almost an endless list. So what are they? The primary problems among them are climate change, you know, floods and suddenly famines and then temperature changes, global warming and all these problems result into production losses, untimely rains, they result into production losses, they result into bringing down the fertility of soil, which further bring down production uh, uh, capacities. And this leads to income losses to an extent that farmers are frustrated and are forced to commit suicides. It's an extremely sorry state of affairs for, for an agricultural country like India. Additionally, there are inadequate transport facilities. There is lack of capital. Access to capital is sparse. Cost of capital is very high. Again, farmers hardly earn any income for them to be eligible to uh, be given any loans or financing facilities. As I said, soil fertility comes down, soil gets eroded. Deforestation largely adds to these problems as well. There are irrigation problems, problems of lack of water availability, lack of sufficient energy availability, high cost of energy, lack of high quality seeds, lack of storage, and lack of mechanization. From consumer standpoint, there's this problem of lack of price, uh, uh, high prices, high wastage. Now, high wastage would be a problem which would fit in for farmers as well as government, as well as consumers. For consumers particularly, high wastage leads to increase in prices. There's irregular supply. Cannot be sure of one particular crop uh, being available Forget entire all through the year, but even in the season of its production. Mangoes is a classic example. Mangoes are not available in the required quantities either for export or for domestic consumption, even during the two or three month season of mango production. There's insufficient penetration across all classes and uh, layers of the society. Quality is inconsistent. Again, transportation delays lead to high prices and inconsistent or irregular supplies. Social instability leads to problems of transport and distribution, as well as they have a direct impact on pricing. There's a long chain of middlemen, which further aggravate the pricing problem. And there's lack of sufficient information or visibility, so to say, through the entire life cycle of the crop from production uh, to consumption. For government, feeding the burgeoning, enormously growing population is the biggest challenge in the world right now. The biodiversity loss, the labor problems, you know, although agriculture is the primary sector, and even today, it employs almost 49% of the Indian population, which is the largest population of any single country in the world. Largely, labor, either skilled or unskilled, doesn't want to stay in that primary sector. Labor is getting constantly migrated from uh, regions of high agricultural activity to cities. Uh, even if their income is less, they still are assured of income if they work in secondary or tertiary sector. At least that is largely the impression that they are carrying. And hence, we see the phenomenon of massive labor migration from away from the agricultural sector. There is lack of standardization and grading, which further leads to wastages, decays, delays, as well as quality loss leading to high prices. There are enormous amount of unregulated malpractices that are rampant in markets all over the country. More inaccessible the region, more underdeveloped the region, more the amount of malpractices. This is also leading to a lot of social and economic disorders and crimes. Lack of infrastructure, we have already talked about not just the transport infrastructure, but the entire storage and cold chain and warehousing facilities. And because of all this, like a vicious cycle, there is low investment in agriculture. Although we saw some very formidable figures in terms of FDIs, that investment in agriculture is still insufficient to overcome all the problems or the investment needed to overcome all the problems. And that is why all these small problems ultimately lead to the big problem of lack of sustainability in agriculture. Now, how does one overcome or how do we jointly overcome this problem of lack of sustainability? So the world over, various national and international organizations have framed science-based policy recommendations for ensuring sustainability of agri-food agri systems. They are largely cutting across 
the health and wellness as well as the production and distribution of agri produce and this is not just limited to human beings this is entirely for all beings on the planet so it is planetary it is truly universal or global in nature so if we throw a quick glance at these these are about promoting the healthy diets util and utilizing the under utilized wild crops their establishment of decentralized cold storage units operating of renewable energy so it will drastically bring down energy cost but even before we start reaping the advantages of reduced cost due to renewable energy the projects themselves may it be the solar project or the windmill project the project themselves demand huge investments promotion of agronomically suitable crop diversification so we have already touched upon the biodiversity point enhancing the role of digital technology in agri food systems computerization digitalization and then dietary supplements this again relates to health and wellness and biodiversity that is crop diversification and establishment of community kitchen so these are some innovative or creative techniques to boost agricultural uh, commodities production and consumption and distribution of course and all these policy recommendations are pretty much in line with the sustainable development goals that is the un united nations sdg as it is popularly known so again throwing a quick glance on the 17 sustainable development goals that are framed by the united nations every each and every goal directly correlates to agriculture poverty reduction hunger reduction good health and well being quality education farmers grossly lack training facilities farmers are largely illiterate so they aren't able to grasp all the modern techniques and the advancements uh, in agricultural practices world over information transmission uh, transmission is also uh, grossly lacking gender equality so there needs to be a rising uh, uh, population of women in agriculture and they have to be skilled trained for uh, better efficiency and better uh, productivity clean water and sanitation affordable and clean energy decent work in economic growth industry innovation and infrastructure reduce inequalities now the point number 10 inequalities is equalities across various parameters they are income inequalities gender inequalities racial ethnic inequalities crop inequalities quantity inequalities quality inequalities all sorts of inequalities sustainable cities and communities responsible consumption and production so responsible is as i said before the triple bottom approach that is profits in addition to people and planet climate action life below water life on land so sustaining life of humans as well as the marine uh, i mean the uh, mammals as well as the marine species and humans as well as all beings on earth small or large a sense of peace social justice and strong institutional framework required in agriculture and partnerships so in my last session i had spoken about synergy in sustainability in agri business so the synergy or the collaboration or the partnerships is an identified goal in the un sdg and so with this background we now actually come to the core of the topic that is our national agriculture policy the aim of our policies is to actualize the vast untapped potential of indian agriculture there is tremendous potential but it's untapped and it's untapped due to the problems which are nagging us right now and they keep haunting us they have been haunting us and they keep haunting us they have been haunting us for decades if not centuries and they keep haunting us haunting us even now the aim is to achieve an annual growth rate in excess of 4% which is a very uh, high ambition target because so far the growth has never exceeded 3 point even currently as we speak the growth is hovering around 3.5% the national agriculture policy today aims at a growth in excess of 4% above 4% to achieve growth with equity you know revisiting the una sdg slides point number 7 uh, point number 10 reduce inequalities or basically in eliminating the inequalities gender inequality income inequality all has to be eliminated regional inequality the growth the distribution of growth has to be equitable and uniform across every nook and corner of india in the world eventually to emphasize the need to cater to domestic markets as well as export markets you know to maximize the gains the benefits from export markets and that's why i was myself involved in the incidence of uh, tax on uh, 
all taxes which are outside the ambit of gst and agriculture was one of them we actually started the study on shafexil uh, sector that is the shellac and forest product sector and this was as recommended in the economic survey of india report to so reducing the incidence of taxes will make indian exports competitive and the benefits have to be gained on priority for the agric agricultural sector and to bring about rural development and land reforms now for these aims the approach to rural development and land reforms will focus on the following areas so consolidation of all holdings remember if we revisit the earlier slide the penultimate point last but one india has world's second largest agricultural land but not all land is available to the farmers for plowing for agriculture for producing good quality crop so the government wants to take control and they want to consolidate the holdings all over the country on the pattern of northwestern states which are the agricultural advanced states relatively maharashtra gujarat goa kerala etc then the next focus is on redistribution of ceiling surplus lands and waste lands among landless farmers so that the unemployed youth get opportunities of employment this has to be accompanied by access to finance so the initial start will be with capital financing tenancy reforms so that contract farming opportunities are also available alongside there is a focus effort on updating and improvement of land records and obviously there is tremendous scope for digitalization and computerization here government plans to uh, digitalize all the land, land records a lot of foreign private players have also entered into this segment to help the government as well as uh, build business on it and it will issue land pass books to the farmers and again recognition of women women's rights on land which means women are now given legally half the share of the land holdings uh, that they inherit as a part of the ancestral property additionally the policy has a few missions and schemes which gives further boost to growth so it has separate mini missions on production technology various production programs these programs are in line with the individual crop value chain according to which the infrastructure augmentation and development will be done and i'll touch upon that uh, in the subsequent slides market intervention and modernization to meet the growing demand in both domestic and export markets there is gramin bandaran yojana largely for construction renovation and expansion of rural go downs this also includes the cold chain facilities for perishable commodities and also to ensure high quality in a standardized manner there is a national policy on cooperatives to provide them with the necessary support to work as autonomous self reliant and democratically managed institutions and this also includes the multi state cooperatives so that they work in a more efficient manner than they are working right now there is emphasis on credit to improve the working capital needs of farmers and farming institutions the fpos and there is mass media support for expanded market outreach now along with the national agricultural policy there is another very relevant and powerful policy or a mission so to say which is the national mission for sustainable agriculture it is one of the eight missions under the national action plan on climate change remember the first problem the most significant problem haunting us today in agriculture is a climate change and so there is this national action plan on climate change of which there are eight missions and national mission for sustainable agriculture nmsa is one of those missions it identifies and addresses the risks associated with climate change and their direct impact on farming agriculture it ensures food security equitable access to food resources to enhance livelihood opportunities so in effect it ensures or it endeavors to ensure national economic stability the various advancements are adopted and they are adapted to for risk mitigation through research and development facilities technological facilities infra and capacity augmentation initiatives and the objective is to harness traditional knowledge for in situ conservation of genetic resources which means the resources need not be in situ wherever they are naturally so they need not be moved they need not be subjected to a lot of 
quality problems because of transportation and storage, etc. But in situ conservation and development of those genetic resources will be encouraged using the harnessing the traditional knowledge and techniques. So this is the national mission for agriculture. In effect, it aims to improve soil health management, fertility, water use efficiency, recycling and purifying water, usability of chemicals, which is eliminating the harmful chemicals uh, and fertilizers, which are used for production, accelerating growth, crop development and diversification. Again, this is about crop biodiversity and adaptation of crop livestock farming systems. And now there is a third policy directly related to uh, these two policies, which is our national logistics policy. Now, this policy this year was launched by our Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi himself. And this itself speaks volumes about how much emphasis there is on developing the logistics infrastructure uh, in India. And within that emphasis, there is a special emphasis on agriculture, obviously, because it is the primary sector. So, this policy was launched to boost the ease of doing business as well as to enhance the livability quotient, particularly for the stressed agricultural sector. This policy aims to lower the cost of logistics from the existing almost 15%, which is a very high cost of logistics as compared to the rate in developed countries, which comes to as low as 8 or even a little above 7 for some countries, developed countries. So the policy aims to lower drastically lower the loss of logistics, uh, logistics almost by half and bring it at par with the other developed countries. It aims to increase the competitiveness of Indian products in both domestic and international markets and the reduced cost will also bring about increased efficiency across all sectors, including, including agric agricultural sector, encouraging value addition and enterprising. That means entrepreneurship opportunity. So the goals of the national logistics policy are coming up with a comprehensive effort, a collaborative effort to address cost and inefficiency. So bringing in some discipline in the system, which is cross-sectoral and multi-jurisdictional for developing the entire logistics ecosystem. It aims to boost economic growth, ease of doing business, provide employment opportunities, and make Indian products most competitive in domestic as well as global markets. It aims to create a modern infrastructure, world-class, best in state-of-the-art facility by including and involving all relevant stakeholders. The government has already opened up all logistics projects for PPP, public-private partnerships, so that it allows for greater synergy during the project's execution. Each and every project is closely tracked and monitored so that the performance is improved on an ongoing basis and the projects are delivered on time or in a lot of cases even before time. Focus is to ensure quick last mile delivery so that all transport related issues will be eliminated, leaving delighted customers, saving manufacturers time and money, as well as preventing wastage. And the coordination improvements in an orchestrated manner will ultimately boost sector growth, value creation, and entrepreneurship. So, the four main pillars to summarize on which the NLP, the National Logistics Policy, rests include integration of digital system, creating a unified logistics interface platform. There is an increased emphasis on unification in general in all policy uh, formulation and uh, regulation in India. As you see, one nation, one tax. GST was also an effort on unification. Similarly, there's an effort on, so identify UI, UIDI is another unification efforts initiative. Similarly, ULIP, the unified logistics interface platform, is also a unification initiative, ease of logistics and continuous improvement. The additional programs under the NLP, that is the Gati Shakti program. This is for uh, implementing infrastructure connectivity, including roadways, railways, as well as airways. So it's an intermodal framework uh, that is uh, undertaken for augmentation and further enhancement. The Sagar Mala project, largely about using the coastline and the waterways, and the Bharat Mala project, which is uh, reducing the critical infrastructure gaps in road traffic circulation. So the golden quadrilateral scheme connecting all the national uh, major state highways in India is a part of the Bharat Mala project. So all three policies combined, N NAP, that is the National Agriculture Policy, NMSA, that is the National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture, and the National Logistics Policy, 
all of which have a direct impact on agriculture and agribusiness growth in india they work on the following major policy drivers that is actualization of growth with equity macro management in planning through programmatic value chain infrastructure development and augmentation remember the example of grapes that i gave concurrent technology advancements stimulating sustainable and profitable investments and quick returns sustainable returns cost effective reduction of losses of perishable commodities by improving cold chain efficiency and facilities cold storage facilities leveraging export oriented agriculture and allied sector opportunities and eliminating long standing impediments in the way of agricultural produce eliminating production losses wastage price fluctuations and removing the inact inadequacies in logistic infrastructure so these are the drivers really of a systemic trans transformation which is bringing about sustainability of agri food systems the transformation begins from transforming mindsets and it all the way continues through transforming mindsets enabling social collaboration changing policies and regulations which is what we are talking about innovative designs for expanding market outreach and providing incentives to involve more and more players in expanding that outreach safeguarding against undesirable climate change effects ensuring easy access to finance stable finance building trust and developing transition pathways by reducing all the gaps eliminating all the gaps and the transformation towards sustainable development goals works through the following matrix so the sustainability is really about sustainability of livelihood sustainability of environment sustainability of nutrition health and wellness and obviously sustainability of production distribution and consumption of the resources available which is all about people planet and profits now the effects of all this policy are clearly visible through the india agritech startups story you know all the companies the logos of which you see here have sprung up in the last few years in less than half a decade and they are on the rapid growth phase and we haven't even scratched the surface the growth spree continues and the growth as you can see from this slide is pretty much in every walk of agricultural activity be made be for market linkages made be for easy access to capital and finance made be in precision agriculture i have already talked about smart technology in agriculture smart farming so there is precision agriculture uh, automation and digitalization in farm inputs high quality availability of high quality seeds the sowing techniques you know uh, there is this kisan drones scheme for which government is providing loans uh, up to a maximum of 10 lakh for farmers and farming institutions and also providing farming as a service in the form of consulting service advisory service as technology support service so this is india's rapidly growing agritech lands landscape and as a tradition i end all my presentations with a big salute and a deep sense of gratitude to all the farmers in india as well as the world over so thank you all the farmers we are exactly at 5:30 halfway through the session and the forum is now open for question and answers i think all the viewers who have joined online uh, rajini will represent them and put in the questions coming from uh, uh, various quarters so thank you everyone and over to you rajini thank you mr mandal for a detailed presentation now i'll take up some questions sure so the first question is yeah what are the key elements of national policy that promote sustainable growth in agri business and how do they contribute to the overall development of the sector sure yeah. so i've just brought everyone back to the earlier slide which i displayed so the major factors are this the goal of national agriculture policy as well as the national mission for sustainable agriculture as well as the national logistics policy all three of them directly contribute to growth of agriculture and agri business so the factors which directly influence 
positively influence the growth of agriculture are actualization of the growth with equity. There is a growth target of uh, more than 4% and all three policies, all the provisions in the policies, all the uh, clauses in the policies are all directed towards achieving and actualizing this growth with equity. As I said, there is a focus on programmatic value chain infrastructure development and augmentation. So I gave the example of gro uh, grapes. You take the example of cotton, you take the example of any other fruit or vegetable, or you take the example of fish, crabs, any other marine agricultural produce, they have their distinct specific value chain. So the entire value chain is thought through and the infrastructure augmentation and development is aligned with the entire set of activities in the value chain of that particular produce, which means separate programs have been launched depending on the demand and the uh, need for focusing on that particular produce and accordingly the micromanagement schemes and programs are set up. Con concurrently, there are technology advancements stimulating sustainable profitability and growth, uh, ensuring that farmers income is increased, they get uh, returns on their investments, investments in terms of capital and investment in terms of efforts, investments in terms of machinery, which is again in a way investment in terms of capital. There is cost effective reduction of losses of perishable commodities by providing cold chain storage facilities. So cold chains are improved. The focus is on price competitiveness for the domestic as well as the agricultural sector. I said tax is a major component here. So uh, GST has already ensured that in a major way, but even for taxes which are outside the ambit of GST, the focus is on reducing the incidence of those taxes drastically so that our products become price competitive, not just in domestic market, but also the international market. And thus, the factors which influence are eliminating the long-standing impediments of production losses, wastages, thereby resulting into income losses of farmers, price fluctuations, and inadequacies in logistics infrastructure. So these are the various factors influencing uh, the growth of agricultural sector in India or acting as impediments. Uh, the various problems you are acting as impediments and the policy, all three policies put together. Also, there is emphasis on synergy, collaborative uh, execution. So that goes a long way in eliminating all this, overcoming all these problems and bringing about the much desired growth. Have I answered the question? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mandar. Okay. So next question. Can you provide insights into the specific goals and targets set by national policy to drive sustainable growth in agribusiness and how progress is being measured? Yes, so I had displayed some progress is being measured by all the standard processes and tools and utilities which have been followed traditionally. So major sources of authentic credible numbers comes from uh, either the uh, Press Information Bureau, PIB by the Government of India or the IBEF, that is the India Brand, Brand Equity Foundation launched uh, directly launched under the Department of uh, Commerce and Industry under the Ministry of Finance. So this is how the various progresses are tracked and they all roll up to uh, the macroeconomic figures. That is, uh, what is the growth rate of the sector? What is its contribution to the uh, GDP, the GVA, that is a gross value add, etc. And the specific goals, as I mentioned, are in line with all these goals of set by the UNSDG, that is United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So like, for instance, no poverty. So no poverty meaning the entire population has to be well fed. So if you see, I have listed the problems of inadequate penetration. Okay. Uh, in uh, the various problems that I have listed, bracketed under farmers, consumers, and uh, uh, government, there's a the first problem listed under the government bracket is growing population. And there is this problem of uh, inconsistent quality and penetration. So penetration meaning the remotest areas, the malnourished areas, the mal the malnourished areas across the length and breadth of the country. Even those areas have to be provided with sufficient transportation and storage facilities so that uh, so if you see in consumers there is insufficient penetration so that the agricultural produce in good quality, consistent quality is delivered to them in time. So 
in one of the factors, I had also called out the quick mile delivery, uh, the quick last mile delivery, which is again, so they all roll up to the major problems or the major based on which the major goals are formulated. That is inadequate storage facilities, inadequate transport facilities, inconsistent quality and high pricing. These all problems have to be overcome and the policy provides for overcoming all these problems, particularly the national logistics policy, as I said, is about creating a unified logistics interface platform, which will ensure shorter and smoother cargo movement. It will also ensure this, so lack of visibility is a problem. So it will also ensure exchange of information on a real time basis. And it will also ensure smooth operation through intermodal logistics. So across modes. So I told you these additional programs under the national logistics policy are the Gati Shakti program. This is to ensure infrastructure connectivity, including roadways, railways, and even airways. Now air is an expensive mode of transport, but wherever the export commodities have to be shipped in time, even airways will, will be utilized. And they all will be utilized in a collaborative manner. So it doesn't help having an inefficient airway alone in order to ship uh, the, the produce from the point of manufacture to the airport, the intermodal facilities have to have also to be equally uh, well developed. And the national logistics policy focuses exactly on that intermodal development. And that's why they have launched special programs under the uh, high level policy, which is the Gati Shakti program, the Sagarmala program and the Bharat Mala program. So this special focus on each and every sector and in turn there is a focus collaboratively on developing the intermodal facilities so these are all some of the special uh, measures particularly you know specifically which are taken to so the gaps are identified so was that not there in the previous policy yes of course it was there the, even the previous policy was uh, framed and formulated by well studied well researched experts what was lacking really was a collaborative approach and efficient execution. Now here there is a government at the center, a strong dynamic government of the center, which is ensuring that different departments and different ministries are engaged in a continuous dialogue and they operate in a collaborative manner so that the problem at hand is resolved and it is resolved well in time. This is the efficient way of functioning and that is where government has a vital role to play and government is uh, you know, has come up with flying colors as far as uh, executing on timelines is concerned. Okay. So next question. <clears throat> How does the national policy address the challenges faced by farmers and agribusinesses in terms of sustainability, climate change, resilience, and resource management? Yes. So these are largely categorized as the first step and sort of the continuous step in bringing about this transformation towards having sustainable food systems is transforming mindsets. Okay. So everybody needs to understand and appreciate that agribusiness or any business is not just about profits. It's about profits. It's about people and it's about the entire planet. So it is about transforming mindsets. It is about enabling social licensing, which is again a collaborative approach, as I said. So a lot of points will be repeated, but they'll be repeated for all good reasons. So the social penetration, penetration has to be the deepest. The lowermost strata of society has to have access to capital, has to have access to resources, and has to have access to basic commodities of consumption. May it be food, may it be clothing, may it be shelter. That is the basis of sustainability. Now, what does one need to do for that? First of all, the policies and regulations have to be reframed so that these are all available legally, formally, officially in the policy for any government to implement. So that is what we are talking about here. Now, is it just one policy? No, there are multiple policies. The three main policies that are, that are talked about are national agriculture policy, national mission for sustainable agriculture, and the national logistics policy. And they are all well in line with the UN SDG. The UN SDG pretty much covers all 
the necessary factors which have a direct impact on sustainability it is for sustainability it is sustainability development goals so no poverty zero hunger good health and well being quality education farmers don't have access to training facilities farmers don't have access to basic educational facilities there is a lot of inequality gender inequality income inequality across farmers and so the policy started with land reforms and making available opportunities for contract farming so if you are a small time farmer who doesn't have enough education who doesn't have enough assets in terms of land or capital or uh, machinery or anything even then they will be provided all support to get access to these basic facilities so if they don't have land wherever there are surplus lands available in fact wherever there are even waste lands available all those will be converted into fertile lands and they will be redistributed to such farmers landless farmers the unemployed youth will be given opportunities of employment they will be given training uh, and, and they will be provided all skilling facilities for them to turn into productive farmers they will be given access to technology and all these companies that i listed about the agri tech startups or the various services as far as financing is concerned as far as consent consent consulting and advisory services are concerned as far as market outreach is concerned you may be a small farmer you may have a small piece of land but it's in the remotest areas you are not educated enough you are not literate enough and you are there is no question of being tech savvy enough yet these companies will provide all facilities and all support for you to connect to the market in fact there are even government initiatives already launched in the form of enam that is electronic uh, national agricultural marketplace and i had already had a session on that i have already also had a session on gem that is government e marketplace which is all about public procurement all of pro public procurement is now consolidated under a unified a unified digital platform uh, for public procurement so if you are a farmer and you don't have access to high quality seeds which will ultimately determine your success in farming then you can just register free of cost on the government e marketplace and you can take the assistance of agritech companies or uh, some technology consultants advisory firms or even individual independent consultant professionals who can help you register on the government uh, e marketplace platform and give you not one but multiple uh, uh, options as to where to source the high quality seeds from and what kind of quality seeds will be available at what prices in what lead times so these are all various uh, on the ground actual facilities so that's why i said this is not just about framing and formulating policies but this is about the first point actualizing growth with equity this actualization is about penetration regional penetration market penetration technology advancements and quick access to all facilities may it be finance may it be advisory support may it be technology may it be market outreach that covers the entire value chain of each and every product and service okay so next question can you highlight any notable initiatives or programs launched under the national policy that have successfully promoted sust sustainable practices and innovation in agri business sure so as far as the national agricultural policy goes i already listed all the special missions and schemes the technology mission see it has separate within the technology mission also it has separate mini missions on production on marketing on distribution so as i told you about the kisan drone scheme so using drone for sowing seeds as well as sprinkling fertilizers or even water some economy budget uh oriented drones are made available to farmers under the kisan drone scheme and government uh has provided for giving them loans up to uh, up, uh, up to all, up to about 10 lakh rupees that is a special scheme so this is pro production technology there is supply chain technology distribution technology marketing technology so all this e national agriculture marketplace which will provide quick access to markets not just in india but world over there is this gramin bhandaran yojana bhandar which is a godown 
a lot of agricultural produce gets rotten and wasted in those rural godowns for lack of enough markets or lack of adequate transportation storage and distribution facilities now government has come up with a capital investment subsidy scheme for construction renovation and expansion of rural godowns this scheme will immensely benefit small and marginal farmers and improve the marketing and distribution infrastructure even in the remotest rural areas there is national co- uh, policy on cooperatives which largely positively impacts the sugar sector sugar is largely driven by cooperatives even today it even impacts the cooperative banks which are the biggest sources of capital finance for farmers rural farmers and these are not just within a state these are multi state cooperatives so the government has provided a policy framework and provisions to enable to provide all the necessary support to enable them to work as autonomous self reliant and democratically managed institutions so uh, until today a lot of these cooperative institutions were largely dominated by uh, politicians and uh, you know rich land owners etc now all that systems uh, have been revamped and it's uh, a democratically managed institutional framework that the policy has provided to them easy access to credit extended credit for farmers help them manage their finances better and mass media support for agriculture extension so for expanding their market outreach these are the specific uh, schemes under the policies for national logistics policies as i said there is integration of digital system unified logistics interface platform ease of logistics that is intermodal connectivity and constant continuous improvement for that they have formed a system improvement group which will monitor all the logistics related projects regularly track monitor and improve in addition to that there are the special programs launched under the national logistics policy these programs are the gati shakti program the sagar mala program about using coastline and waterways and the bharat mala program about increasing the road traffic circulation effectiveness so as i said these are concurrent technology advancements which will bring about profitable uh, investments as well as returns for farmers and this is macro management as well as micro management so the macro management is having all these provisions in the policies and micro management is launching programs for individual crop value chain infrastructure development and augmentation so this will help eliminate all these long standing problems of wastages production losses soil erosion income uh, losses price fluctuations and inadequacy of logistics infrastructure okay how does uh, national policy encourage the adoption of technology and digital solutions in agri businesses agri business to enhance efficiency productivity and sustainability <clears throat> uh so i have already covered this actually but see if you see in national mission for sustainable agriculture there is this adaptation and risk mitigation through r&d through technology through infrastructure and through capacity so now these four tenets cover all the various risks risks which farmers or in general agri business institutions have to go through adaptation what is adaptation if there is a climate change if there is an untimely rain how do farmers adapt to it so they have tech they have infra and they have the capacity which means in a multi state cooperative if there are land made available in regions which are outside the scope of these untimely rains because the untimely rains may not affect the entire country in fact they will seldom affect the entire region in india all the regions in india so through tech through contract farming collaborative initiatives if there is untimely rain as an example in one part of india the lands the resources and the capacities available in other regions of india can produce a surplus to meet the unfulfilled demand this is adaptation risk mitigation let's say there is a surplus surplus production in uh, one particular area one particular season and there are no adequate storage or transportation facilities so the infra the logistics policies provides for development of cold chain storage facilities as well as the gramin bhandaran yojana provides for 
कंस्ट्रक्शन रिनोवेशन एंड मेंटेनेंस और एनहांसमेंट ऑफ रूरल गोडाउन्स सो दीज फैसिलिटीज विल हेल्प मिटिगेट द रिस्क ड्यू टू सरप्लस प्रोडक्शन नॉट बींग एबल टू बी स्टोर्ड और डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड प्रॉपरली हेन्स the national mission for sustainable agriculture as it is rightly called will ensure sustainability and national economic stability as well okay couple of more questions oh next is can you shed light on the role of public private partnerships in implementing the national policy and fostering sustainability growth in agri business sure so until now it was largely a blame game that was being played between these three players as i said the problems that i have listed here on this slide okay these problems they are not necessarily problems bracketed for farmers consumers or government they are common problems they have overlaps almost each of the problem almost each of the problem affects all the major stakeholders which is farmers consumers government there are many more institutions like there are a lot of middlemen there are a lot of these Uh, uh intermediary uh, entities but largely it is between the farmers and the consumers and the regulatory authority which is the government okay so now until now lot of pro pro policies well were well, well, well thought through well researched uh, studied experts what they were lacking was uh an effective focus on an orchestrated collaborative approach apart from that what was missing was the last point here that i have mentioned listed in the government uh, section low investment in agriculture now low investment is one way of looking at it the other way of looking at it is the point above low investment see there was lack of adequate infrastructure infrastructure is mainly production facilities storage facilities and distribution facilities now investments in infrastructure are huge and no government no single government or lot of international governments now we have this g20 okay which is a group of 20 nations which are in rapid economic growth phase so even group of nations cannot are constrained which means they cannot allot sufficient budgets to making investments in infrastructure so what is the only option to call Infrast investments in infrastructure from the private players, obviously because the private players are also affected. Food and agriculture being one of the basic commodities, the primary sectors. If that sector is stressed, no matter how much our budgetary allocations are made, the entire public and private institutional framework is affected adversely. So government opened up the policy for public-private investment partnerships so that the problem of blame game is eliminated forever. i have myself attended this uh, annual event of siam which is society of uh, indian automobile manufacturers in which uh, the minister for uh, our uh, national shipping and infrastructure development minister mr nitin gadkari himself was uh, addressing all the 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 big wigs in the automotive industry and one constant complaint that they had was infrastructure is highly insufficient to handle the kind of production capacities that we are all set to increase and at the same time the policy environment is not conducive so mr gadkari said up front that look if you keep on playing the blame game if you keep on cribbing about how government is not doing its best despite all governments doing their best or even government walking extra steps to go beyond the best then nothing is going to come out of it instead government will put in some money the private players will put in some money and will go into ppp mode that is public private partnerships mode now wherever private enterprises want to invest they stand a chance to gain because uh, they become a beneficiary of the government bonds which are created as well as the most important point is that infrastructure gets augmented in uh, less amount of time than it would have in absence of these investments and once infrastructure gets augmented economic growth increases so these are the public private partnerships mode and that government opened in all walks of agricultural activity or business activity which is technology research and development infrastructure and capacity i have listed all of them here you see here in nmmc the point towards your left adaptation and risk mitigation through r and d 
so there is scope for ppp in r&d companies which are doing doing only research and development in agriculture companies which are only the technology players in agriculture technology is again software as well as hardware e-commerce digital digital platform as well as uh, uh, electronic marketplaces all kinds of infrastructure it's about the road uh, rail and uh, uh, coastal network as well as the storage facilities and it's about capacity building through mechanization and automation so public private partnerships are opened up and encouraged in all spheres of activity within the agricultural uh, sector and the effect of that is what you see here in india's fabulous growth story and as i said this is not an exhaustive list in fact we haven't even scratched the surface this is the tip of the iceberg so this is about public private partnerships and this is the fabulous effects of those partnerships that we are seeing a lot of these organizations are funded by the government a lot of them are uh, funded privately by uh, private equity firms or venture capitalists uh, or large corporate houses themselves so okay. this is about public private partnerships in agriculture yeah. so are there any financial incentives or support mechanisms available for farmers and agri businesses to increase the adoption of sustainable practices outlined in the national policy see for a long time we uh, were sort of dragging ourselves and i would rather say there was a lackadaisical approach in the subsidy regime there was subsidy everywhere okay but the subsidy was taking a toll on the country's economy because all the subsidies that the government granted were basically collected from direct and ind indirect sources of government revenue which is largely taxation now the government has reinvented itself through these policy reforms and majority of those subsidies are eliminated the only subsidy scheme that remains today is the gramin bhandaran yojana the capital investment subsidy, subsidy scheme which involves subsidies for construction renovation and expansion of rural go downs now even here there is public private partnerships <clears throat> so while on the one hand the subsidies are granted to farmers on the other hand shares and equity benefits are granted to investors so this will attract investments and it will ultimately help eliminate the entire burden of subsidies from government of india that is a further boost to growth that is a further boost to achieving the economic stability of the nation okay this so, is progressive institutional institutionalization okay so uh, now we'll take the last question yeah because the time is almost up yeah. and i'm really glad there are so many questions but at the same time i honestly hope uh, that i have been able to answer all the questions to uh, the satisfaction of the audience. yeah it was all clear and so we'll take up the last question can you share any success stories or case studies that demonstrate the positive impacts of the national policy on sustainable growth in agri business particularly in terms of economic social and environment environmental outcomes see just about a minute is too less a time to share the fabulous spectacular success story but i can only say the success story you can summarize it yes so one of my uh, very uh, favorite and common examples because i have myself uh, uh, had uh, first hand experience dealing with them is that of an organization called kisan connect okay this was an organization which got it's an ahmednagar based organization in maharashtra this was an institution uh, this was an organization which got instituted during the covid times kisan connect i had presented that case study in one of my earlier sessions okay with very few with very less capital with very few resources and with very less access to credit and capital this institution started uh, distributing fresh farm produce to consumers and in less than 2 years time it grew to a whopping 4 crore organization uh, completely bootstrapped and the growth is still rising how they were able to do it because they set up a farm to uh, fork model wherein farm produce was sourced from uh, farmers spread over a large region initially only within maharashtra but later on also outside maharashtra 
they set up quality units to quality test all the produce so that substandard quality is not delivered there were special measures and initiatives taken for sanitization of the produce during the covid times uh, eco friendly biodegradable as well as sanitized packing products uh, were made available and efficient distribution through uh, a, uh, a pre declared published schedule and contract resources uh, as delivery boys uh, was set up because of which customer satisfaction was quite quickly achieved and that is why the company uh, started growing very soon uh, they re they redeployed their uh, surplus gains into technology investments and they also came up came up with a website and an app which further facilitated placing orders and uh, ensuring delivery at doorstep and that is why the company is constantly growing and entirely through this growth story they were uh, benefited by all the policy provisions in all the policies that i elaborated on in the last hour which is national agricultural policy national mission for sustainable agriculture and national logistics policy okay yeah okay mr mandar i don't see any more questions from our participants so now we have come to end of question round on uh, behalf of agricultureinformation.com we like to thank you for a very detailed presentation and answering all the questions in depth and we also like to thank all our participants for joining this meeting the meeting will now be closed sure thank you too and i once again thank you all farmers in the entire farming community in india as well as the world over thank you yeah and for your information this meeting is recorded and uh, we'll try to upload uh, in various social media links sure that would be great thank okay, you yeah. thank you